Argentina, Faculty of Science and I'm going to introduce Margaret. Um, so, there's two parts I'm going to go with the first one, which is a little bit more the, the stuff you need to know. Margaret is uh, co-founder and principal of uh, the Sanchez-based Griffin Enright Architects, and their works. The collaborative practice that yields creative, forward-thinking designs. Uh, the work combines innovation and experimentation with desire to explore cultural complexities relative to the built environment. And I think that's, you know, it's pretty fair and it's, it's pretty uh, uh, on in terms of the, the work. Um, Griffin Embrack Architects have been published international, uh, locally, nationally. They have won uh, numerous awards and numerous means, like lots of them. I'm just looking at their curriculum and their CV on the website, I was actually almost shocked to see like, you know, the amount of stuff, you know, and, uh, and recognitions they get. Um, in addition to running a immersion and quite successful, I will have practice. Margaret also uh, has a career, in uh, academic career, in addition to teaching at SIRC. She has taught at the University of such as USC, UCLA, and Syracuse, where she is actually uh, a graduate. She's also part of the LA Forum, I guess she's a treasurer, but, uh, which talks about her public involvement and a member of, uh, newly appointed member, I think, of a design review at City of Santa Monica. Is that around? Close. Yeah. Hey. Um, so, I'd like to say a couple of words about Griffin and Wright's work. Um, I would like to kind of claim maybe that, you know, the work of Griffin and Wright is both unconventional uh, and versatile. It's unconventional because the forms and spaces they produce transcend what is known and usual within architectural conventions, and yet manages to stay, you know, quite close to the them. It's also conventional because it defies easy uh, and quick readings. It's versatile because the solutions don't follow a recipe or an a priori formula of what architecture should be, but finds a singularity in, it, in the formal and conceptual interrogation of site, or program, or context, or technology, or certainly landscape. Um, it's versatile because they produce you know, quite livable spaces uh, that they're not always in your face. And this is actually quite important after you know, visiting or having the opportunity to visit um, one of the projects. So the work resides in form, that's definitely no doubt about it, but it certainly moves beyond form. Uh, several layers of materials and meanings are aggregated together in each of the projects. Um, even the more abstract, the proposal for the vertical garden at the Shingle House, what I think we're going to see, or the proposal for the future of Los Angeles, managed to fuse a deep interest in the tectonics of forms and materials with a social and political agenda. Now, this is of course a work of uh, collaboration, but we have Margaret here as a speaker so to grab this in a kind of more individual and not just in you know individual terms of personalities and not the work, I would say that her interest in landscape, uh, land form, as she calls it, and this is the research that takes back from her uh, work in the American Academy in Rome, transcends the 90s ideas of fusing um, architecture with ground or the interest in continuous surfaces. Uh, to move landscape in a maybe much more direct and visceral attitude. Uh, one that ranges from um, interest in vegetation to gardening. Uh, the own house uh, is actually a testimony to this fact, to issues of irrigation, water, uh, to the relevance of all these topics have today in the context of climate change, a renewed interest in sustainability and clean technologies. So, after all this, I'd like to welcome Margaret Griffin, maybe the more political, polemic, and versatile part of Griffin Empire. Isn't synthetic strategies. Um, this is a picture I took this morning. You can see that our office is not paperless. In fact, um, we're attempting to bury ourselves in paper. I think uh, if you took all the the mass of the paper, either in our office or in the storage sheds behind our office, um, it weighs some amount more than, than the structure of our office itself. Um, we work a lot through a process of um, continual refinement and uh, 
this means that we're working back and forth between drawings, physical models, and digital models um, almost continuously. Um, this is um, the kind of small conference room that we have, which double functions as our brainstorming room. And the wall that you see there is the wall that we use to gather all of our research on any given project that we're working on. Right now, that's a bunch of research on the Washington, um, the Washington Monument, because we're working on a, a competition for the site under the Washington Monument, um, which I'm actually not gonna show today, but uh, this is the table where we meet all together as a group. Our office um, is very collaborative, and um, so we not only have the kind of synthetic condition of two partners, but also of the, um, all the individuals in our office at any given time. Um, and that's a really important part of, of, of the work that we um, produce. square feet so it's a very uh, tight and small space that we do a lot of our, our, our thinking in. Um, our work is defined by an interest in latent logics of external and internal conditions that are measured against each other to create transformed sensibilities that resist um, reduction to ideal forms. We have an interrogative approach that leads to a redefinition of content where form, structure, and performance are negotiated uh, towards new spatial hybrids. We deploy strategic thinking to cross-examine uh, site-specific conditions while we reposit performance criteria to create open-ended effects and spatial conditions. Our morphological approach similarly extends from logics of the terrain, landform, to logics of the body and movement and yields a dynamic condition of space where the experience of deformation creates new examinations of content. Um, we use analog processes and uh, digital feedbacks to diagnose specific dialectic of external and internal logics on a project by project basis that yields a heterogeneity within our work that extends our mission of exploration um, and furthers an ethos of experimentation. Um, this also allows us to take on projects of differing scales and contexts, um, such as scales in the urban scapes, landscapes, as well as domestic scapes and interior scapes. Um, ultimately, uh, the, the way that we find um, a kind of vehicle into the project allows for new opportunities um, for interaction and behavior and new interrelationships um, between previously discrete conditions. So um, I just have a few projects that I'm going to show today and I'm going to try to move through them very quickly and explain a little bit more um, about how we develop some of our um, strategic thinking. Um, so the first project is a project that we did for the Vertical Garden Competition, um, which was sponsored uh, by SciArc and also by the MAC, and we were invited to participate in, as were um, a lot of other uh, instructors at SciArc. Um, this plan that you see right here was the plan that was uh, given in the project statement. And the stated kind of issue was to design a vertical garden along this red line. Um, above you see the kind of uh, physical model of the Schindler House. These um, are two views of the site. 
here is the site in its more original condition uh, when it was a kind of agrarian um, bean field. And uh, you see here the Hollywood Hills beyond, behind. And then here is um, the kind of area of the city in a more recent condition where you see um, more, uh, a kind of more urban development um, in this area of town. So this is, again, some more description of the existing site, but you can see all along uh, King's Road is now multifamily housing, um, and there still exists some single-family housing behind the property. For us, um, the problem really wasn't about um, making a, a vertical garden between the new building um, and the Schindler House. It was really about how to rethink of the condition of the Schindler House. Um, we were interested in the kind of original condition, in the current condition, and to us, um, the problem of the Schindler House really couldn't be solved by just a wall. It really had to be rethought altogether. So, um, what we were interested in is thinking of the Schindler House as a new urban condition. Um, we recognize that it was a residential um, project, but no longer really functions as a residence. Um, it functions as this kind of relic and, um, and also as a, as a gallery, so it has this kind of new program and um, a very new context. So one of the things that we started looking at right away was to think about what if uh, we thought of a series of double helix ramps began to surround the site and this create two discrete paths that create a new urban landscape, uh, a new vertical urban landscape. So the idea that we had was to excavate 45 feet down and uh, make the building go uh, 45 feet tall. So we are interested in this context of the project, that um, the area had a 45 foot height limit, and we wanted to explore that uh, height both as a kind of carve out into the ground and as a new um, plateau. So by excavating 45 feet down, we were able to create a new amphitheater that would be uh, beneath the Schindler House, and by going 45 feet in the air, we were able to recreate a, a new, um, sort of, we call it the sky meadow, but a new um, landscape condition at the new ground plane of the city in this area, which is the 45 foot height limit. Um, we also thought of the existing Schindler House as this um, artifact, as, as you can see with the analogy to the ship in the bottle. And we thought of the new double helix ramps as a kind of glass bottle around the artifact. And the Schindler House was to be pinned into the new envelope and uh, suspended. And we kept two of the garden courtyards, um, the front one and the back one, and uh, kind of removed that whole piece from its existing ground plane. Um, so as the ramps move around the site, um, they shift in and out from this new envelope that's created by uh, c connecting the edges of the ramp. So as you move inside and outside on the ramps, you get um, discrete views either into the um, center of the project where the Schindler House is pinned or back out to the city. Here you see the four sides. Um, these ramps are actually handicap accessible ramps. And this, uh, doing the two ramps in this way would bring the whole project up to code and um, also accommodates our second means of egress uh, in addition to becoming the structural system of the, of the envelope. Here you can see the sky meadow and the kind of relationship to the city at large, as well as the oculus that is um, carved through the center of the, of the um, project that frames a view back to the Schindler House. This is the um, a physical model. 
that's the kind of quality that um, of space that it would yield. And so the double helix ramps obviously also uh, interconnects in a continuous manner the amphitheater to the street, to the Schindler House, and to the Sky Garden. So um, another project that we these seven projects that I'm showing today, we worked on um, all um, during a similar time period. Um, some projects that we get to work on are very quick, uh, lasting only a few weeks, and other projects that we work on um, last uh, seven years. So um, a project that you'll see at the end was started at the very beginning of this whole project, and, or this whole process, and it just finished. Um, you all are familiar with the space of the gallery. Um, what was fascinating to us about this space was the, um, obviously the industrial quality of this building and we are interested in um, exploring some ideas about um, kind of uh, materiality of, of organic and inorganic. Um, we began to look at the material of sod, and we were very, specifically hydroponic sod, and we are very intrigued with the fact that it's a simultaneously organic and man-made. Um, it's farmed on thin sheets of plastic out in the desert, and uh, what the hydroponic means is it's a soilless sod. It's, you can see some kind of dirty roots there, but basically there, there is no dirt. It's just kind of farmed on these sheets of plastic and the seeds um, develop a, a thick root base that um, makes it very light. Um, so it's only three pounds a square foot. And what we started to, and so one of the things about this sort of organic material is we um, were interested in the potential of, of entropy. And we are also curious about this material in the, our desert environment of LA and the kind of overuse of this material. Um, so we used it as a way to kind of research this material in more depth. We ended up uh, deciding that we would um, create the, a thin plane out of this grass and um, make a thin undulating plane and float it in space. So we are interested again in the man-made quality and emphasizing the thinness of this plane as a way of um, talking about the, the man-made condition of the material. At the same time, we uh, started to get the material and, and work with it so that we could understand its, um, the way that it would change over time. Um, this is uh, some prototypes that we looked at. We, use sort of high-tech uh, uh, methods in a very low-tech way. We basically used a CMC machine like a jigsaw, um, and we created these undulating um, beams that uh, we could span with steel pipes to create a rolled surface that would um, create a kind of dynamic condition of space underneath and begin to make a plane that separated the gallery into two spaces, a kind of above condition that related to the bridge and a kind of below condition that was a, a whole other feeling of space. Underneath the sod, we placed these um, pools of water, um, which had to do with a kind of irony. We, we intentionally did not water the, the grass and we were um, interested in the relationship of of, of, of water to the to the sod, and then we use the reflecting poles underneath as a way to kind of uh, shoot light through the piece and reflect light back to the space underneath, as well as a way to orchestrate movement and reflect um, reflect the movement. The water line that you see beyond um, right here, this line of light represented a kind of uh, line, what we called a water line in the room, and if you fill the room up to that line with water, that's how much water 
it would take to keep that amount of grass alive for one year. So we are interested in connecting the area of the sod to the kind of volume of water that it would take to keep it alive. And that also led us to understand some of the environmental problems with sod, um, especially in the desert environment. And so above that line, that water line of light, we placed um, a lot of uh, statistics that we had discovered that had to do with this material and, and its use in our, in our urban scape. One of the reasons why we called it Keep Off the Grass is because many times when you see a lawn um, uh, in, our, in our landscape, many times the lawn is not allowed to be used and there's often a sign that says Keep Off the Grass. So while culturally it seems to be a material that everyone is passionate about, um, in other ways, uh, it seems to get little use and has an, a lot of environmental cost that comes with it. Um, it provides a lot of air pollution. One of the, my favorite things that we discovered was that the gallons of gas spilled annually by garden equipment was you know, one and a half times the gallons of gas spilled by Exxon Valdez annually. So these are some of the qualities of um, the interaction of the people and the, and the light and the reflecting pools. So there's this kind of quality of space that we were after as well. Part of, um, part of the way that we suspended this thin material over the beams um, had to do with this gap that you see here, it was literally floating off the beams. And um, that joint that had to do with navigating uh, a different angle at every single time, not only helped uh, the, the sod really feel like a floating condition, but it, it was the, the thing that we worked on for um, the whole two weeks that we designed the project. So part of what happened over time uh, was that as the sod began to deteriorate um, and dry, it began to shrink. And when it shrank, it actually never went brown fully. It remained partially green, but it uh, created a new um, perforation. So the plane that originally separated the space below the, the sod and the space above the sod became reconnected again. And um, the, you had this kind of new quality to the space where that plane became really um, pervious. Part of the, 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 another way that the entropy was really felt was through smell. It had a poignant smell, uh, both when it was installed and all the way through the exhibit. So the smell also permeated the walls and uh, went beyond the gallery. Here you can see the quality of space being underneath and, ha and the kind of reconnection when the sod shrunk. So um, we also, work on a lot of residential work, and each of those projects uh, comes with uh, a whole set of, of interests um, that aren't always in our control. But within that, we try to find uh, ways that um, we still um, can bring a kind of new way of thinking to the project that, that creates uh, opportunities for for, for living that, that is formally un, unpredicted by, the, by our clients. This project is a really tiny house in the Hollywood Hills, and um, the client is Danish, and the, his wife is from Guyana. He's a record producer, and she's a singer. And one of the things that they had was a, a really amazing collection of Dan modern furniture. Um, and this kind of uh, modern furniture existed in this sort of uh, post.
Paris War, part Tudor, Tudor part French country house. So one of the missions was to um, make a contemporary project um, that more befitted the, the, the lifestyle that they are after. Yet they really, um, because of the constraints of the site, there was a lot of um, grandfathered in conditions, so we needed to make the project as a renovation and not as a new build. Um, it was also a really cost-effective project, so um, it was done for about 230 a square foot, which is very low for a, a renovation in Los Angeles. Um, so some of the main things that we did was we took the lower level of the house, this is the demolition plan, and basically everything in red is what we removed, and so we essentially removed the stair out of the center of the house and, and added basically one column that you can see here and four beams and made a new open uh, living space. And at the same time, we, in section, we uh, expanded the kind of um, view from inside to out such that you could now see from the front of the property to the rear of the property and the house, um, uh, the boundaries of the house were expanded and you could feel the, the full sight through that. These are some of the kind of before and after shots, but what I'm really trying to highlight is um, the kind of new quality of the space. So here, we basically took this bay windows that they had and really made these kind of overscaled window boxes that create the new front and camouflage the um, existing pitched roof that still remained. Um, Oh, this is weird. This is a view, um, it's a new view looking from inside to outside, although this is really strangely smushed. There you can look back in and you see the new column and uh, four beams. Um, the library was part of the new addition. We only added 300 square feet. We added two rooms and uh, relocated the stair. So the new addition comprised of this uh, new stair that you see here, of the library below and of one room above. Um, so what we did with the library was we began to step it up into the hill so that we could make that visual connection to the backyard uh, occur. And it gave us a new way to connect the living space directly to the backyard. The new um, library exists as a kind of room within a room and part of that has to do with um, the kind of uh, we have a really simple material palette we mostly the material palette is a kind of black and white and the inversion within the library uh, where we made the ceiling black and the floor white versus the rest of the space where the floor is um, dark and the ceiling is white this uh, simple uh, material inversion give a uh, really um, switch this because this is weird. The thing is very strangely stretched. Um, anyway, this gives the quality of a room within a room. Here you can see that uh, looking to the backyard, the kitchen. The stair, we made it feel like uh, two components. So one part of the stair feels more public, and uh, at the top landing you can see down to the courtyard beyond. The other half of the stair is uh, behind a, a new wall that's inserted in the, in the kind of skylighted, skylit stair, and that makes a more private um, entry up to the upper rooms. From the bedroom, you can see how the window boxes, the overscaled window boxes, really expand the space of the bedroom. And um, here you see this kind of submarine ladder to the roof that becomes a new um, stair to a rooftop garden where you can get an amazing view of the city. Um, that's the kind of secret garden where Karsten can go uh, smoke his cigars and drink his wine with his buddies. This is the quality of the window box in the master bedroom, and, or the master bathroom, and this is the tub which exists right over the entry to the house. 
And this is the new um, addition from the rear and how you can um, get this like extended vista through the property. The, the whole property on this is only 4,300 square feet and only 2,000 square feet of the property is flat enough to build on. There's a huge cliff behind the house. So part of the challenge was how to expand the volume of the house. This project uh, is a really unbelievable site up on the top of Point Doom. Um, you can see Point Doom is right here in Malibu. So that's the actual Point Doom. And there's another knoll. So this is a huge knoll. Those of you who drive up the coast, I'm sure you recognize this huge kind of outcropping that's a big hill. There's another hill behind it, which is right right up here. And our, the property that our client owns, which is right here, straddles that hill. And so part of his house is up on the highest point of Point Doom. And he has these amazing views. Um, out, not only out to the ocean, but back to Santa Monica and uh, Palos Verdes, and actually on a clear day he can see Catalina. So part of the way that we situated the house had to do with these views, and had to do with setting up uh, different views from different parts of the house, and it also had to do with uh, relating to the coastline, because when you're on that property, the way the coastline frames that view is an um, important part of how you experience um, the site. So the house uh, become, begins to become bent, and this uh, bending has to do with um, the sequence of movement in the house, as well as setting up these views. So the entrance to the house is, is right here, and you enter midway um, in an in-between level. You either descend roughly uh, seven feet or, or ascend roughly seven feet to the upstairs. And um, as you descend down, the space begins to bend around. The, the kind of bending of the house also creates a private courtyard back here between the mother-in-law unit and the, and the kitchen. And the mother-in-law unit um, has views, you can see it here. The mother-in-law unit has views beside the house, but also through the house. Um, in this project, we also worked with the landscape design, and there's a kind of seamless quality between the morphology of the uh, movement systems of the house and the movement systems within the garden. Here in this section, you can see how the house uh, carves into the hillside and makes use of the hillside, and how you enter at this mid-level and either go down to the living room or go up to the, to the bedrooms above. You can see in this uh, model some of that quality of the dynamic condition. So this is um, the back side of the house. Uh, you arrive on the site via a long uh, driveway up the hill, and you arrive into a car court. Um, here you see these peel-out uh, walls that give a view from the bedrooms, which are at the back of the house, to the ocean. This is the main entrance, and you see how you arrive in this very vertical space that gets um, amazing natural light, very um, indirect and beautiful natural light from above, that, that has a really, um, you, you're very apparent of the kind of vertical quality of space as you descend down in and, and start to bend around. Um, there's a big light box that runs down the center of the house as a custom fabricated kind of piece that's in between furniture and architecture that uh, continues the, the, the kind of feeling of the path to the out, outdoor, outdoor porch beyond. And also sets up this very um, kind of horizontal view of the living room. So once you move through this sort of very vertical bent space, you arrive in a very horizontal uh, space that, 
that um, uh, really frames the view of the horizon beyond. Um, and then within that view, you see the terrace beyond that continues as a line and, and bends around further, where you get this kind of quality at the very end of the whole sequence. So the bent hallway creates a kind of threshold to the living space where the, the, the ocean is revealed. And at the end of the whole sequence, you also get this, um, this very long line with a kind of um, wall beside it that is a privacy wall for um, an outdoor shower and at the end a jacuzzi. And those two elements frame the distant view of these Santa Monica mountains. This opening right here is 22 feet wide and 11 feet tall. Um, so um, this client, all of our clients like strong connections to the outdoors, but this is actually one client who always has his house completely open. He literally lives outside all the time and um, the, the living room really functions like a big porch. What happens on the upper floor is that the, the master bedroom peels back and sets up a, a, different, a different view than the view from the living room space below. These are some of the views of the hallway and you can see how it also um, has to do with the movement on the second floor and the connection between the bedrooms. This is taken from the, the connection to the two um, secondary bedrooms and this is the master bedroom beyond. So there's a kind of bridge between uh, those two. Here you see the view from the master bedroom door back to the entrance and there's a bridge connecting to the other bedrooms. And this is a view from the actual master bedroom itself where there's a big window <coughs> looking back into that hall. Um, it's another view of the master bedroom and its outdoor porch. Here you see that, that peel back that yields a um, porch above and also um, sets the bedroom up for this uh, different view. This uh, peel out in the master bath is, uh, this is a shower right there, so this gives um, an amazing framed view from the shower. Which you see here from the outside. The, this space here is the library, so the bookshelves of the library kind of come out of the building and be, become these fins on the outside of the, the project that are extended over the whole face of the rear of the house and also become a kind of um, railing system for the upper deck that you see here. The owner um, is always on his cell phone and tends to pace. So this oculus not only provided light to the porch below, but also this right outside the master bedroom provided plenty of territory for his pacing. Here you can see the kind of connection to the pool that, that's also yielded. Um, this project is a competition entry that we did for the cafe at Sire. We were shortlisted. Um, of course, Marcelo won it, although that's not the one that we see built, <laughs> obviously. Marcelo can probably tell us more about that story, but our proposal had to do with like really being interested in the kind of formal condition of the building that we're in which was we were intrigued about the kind of length of it and about the, um, uh, the, the, the kind of con connection to the railroad tracks. And um, so we proposed that the cafe should, um, at the time the cafe was slated to be located at, at this end of the, these seem to be two drawings are related, but anyway, at this end of the, of the, of the building. And we thought that it, this was, kind of problematic because uh, since it's very long, it's, it's is not so central. So part of what we were interested in is the, is the kind of quality of Sciarc as a place that has many centers and doesn't have one center. Um, 
So our strategy was to put the cafe on a train chassis and to put some train tracks out, out along the building and to create a, a cafe that would move up and down the building like a dirigible. And it could be parked at different places along the, the building depending on an event that it might be serving. So it could be parked at the gallery or it could be parked um, outside the lecture hall. And in that way, it would also become a kind of sign about where the activity was. Um, the cafe would be kind of clipped onto the building, and it would consist of a series of uh, simple components, uh, a reused um, rail car platform. There would be various docking bays. There would be a kitchen module that would slip inside that would be lockable at night and would hold all the components of the kitchen, like a diner wood or like a, a roach coach wood. It would also have an elevator up to the conference room, uh, a shell structure, and then photovoltaic panels that would um, provide the power. These are um, uh, thin uh, polyvinyl panels that could be stretched over the frame and they would power the um, the cafe as it moves up and down the building. So the cafe had a kind of part of a, a kind of storage component, a kind of diner component, and then some space to eat your food as well as the, the, the kind of space that would be made between the cafe and the building would provide more uh, porch-like space to, to hang out in and eat your food. It would, um, I think part of the, the kind of canopy quality was about shading the, the building as well and shading the kind of space in between the cafe and the, and the, and the building. Um, this is a very tiny interior project that we worked on, uh, which is for a church. It was a new sanctuary. So here you see the existing condition of the church, which was actually, um, its bones outside were pretty interesting. It was designed by a modern Polish architect in the 50s, but the interior had never been completed and um, existed as a kind of mishmash of various um, time periods. Part of what they needed in the project was essentially new HVAC, and they wanted to update the the space um, of the interior. So our <coughs> solution was to put a new canopy in that would um, enhance the lighting condition. You can see that the, the materiality uh, was very, had a very dark quality and um, we wanted to enhance the illumination both natural and artificial in the space as well as the new canopy became a way to kind of hide the H back above and feed it out the sides. So uh, this is the existing ceiling, and this are a, the series of operations that led us to the the kind of fluid shell that we created. Um, all having to do with um, ways to create responses to the to the natural light. The new, um, the new ceiling provides a new connection from the stained glass window at the front of the church to, to the new altar. So this is the last project. Uh, this is one that we began seven years ago, uh, which was had our practice for three years. We've been um, practicing on our own now for 10 years, and um, this is a project that's taken seven years to, to accomplish. Uh, this is a school in the Pico Union District, which is currently called the Byzantine Latina Quarter. But it's a very tough part of town and also a very dense part of the city. Um, this is the, the site here. This is um, Loyola High School down here. This is San Sofia, which is the Greek Orthodox Church. And this is the Catholic Church that is St. Thomas, and the existing school is here. 
So our strategy on this project um, had a lot to do with in economy of means. This is a project that is half the budget of an LAUSD school, which uh, is already an incredibly um, low budget um, project. So this project is was completed for uh, $230 a square foot um, just this year, which is um, means that there was a lot of strategic choices. Um, so part of how we thought about this project was that we tried to make every constraint into an architectural opportunity. Um, and every single move on the project had to accomplish three or four or five things at a time. Um, and so it was uh, kind of about boil, boiling things down to the kind of essences of what, uh, what, what one can achieve. So the existing building is here. So it's basically a renovation of this building is a new underground parking here and a new multi-purpose room that's also a gym, a new art room, art and science room, and a new library. Um, and some of the, so the main thing that we did was we create a new urban porch. Uh, outdoor space that is uh, becomes a nexus for um, for the campus and for activities on the campus. Um, and making an outdoor space uh, not only uh, was a place for the for the lunch room, but it's a way to to make a public space in the project um, at a very reduced cost because um, all you need is a roof. So some of the, the kind of strategies were that the new project uh, needed to upgrade the existing building um, for ADA. So one of the big moves of the project was to take a, a required handicap ramp and exaggerate it. So instead of having a four foot handicap ramp, we, we made it 10 feet wide and we made it into a new street. Um, so you arrive on this ramped street into campus um, and into the kind of heart of the, of, the, of the big porch. At the same time, the site needed to have proper fire egress, so there was a road wrapping, we had to put a new fire road wrapping all around the site, and that fire road um, also created a new drop-off for the parents. So now um, all the traffic that was originally on the streets um, became wrapped around the school and now there's a, a kind of orderly drop off. So uh, one also arrives at the school from this direction and from this direction. So this new place um, accommodates both. The, the, that diagram was about showing the new stair that we put in and how the new stair connects to paths that, that that are also bridges that are extensions of the existing circulation system of the building. And so between the ramp and the new stair, we create a new loop on campus that um, provides uh, new flexibility with connecting all the existing components of the, of the site. Here you can see more views of that. Um, the structure was also highly efficient and very light. So part of how we got this new room was that we used uh, the backspan of the, of the multi-purpose room in the gym to create a cantilevered condition. And these are off-the-shelf off the Volcraft trusses that we used, which are very, very cost-effective. Um, we used very industrial materials, um, of course, corrugated um, siding, and we also used expanded, galvanized expanded metal mesh that you see here, very industrial, very mesh, messy actually when you see it close. Um, and then for uh, this kind of more special backdrop element, it's simply um, stucco, not even a smooth finished stucco, it's a sand finished stucco with uh, reglets creating a, a pattern and um, paint. So we used a kind of gradient of oranges to create a kind of glow within the, the urban porch. This is the view from the existing building out through to the new playground. 
and this is from the upper porch looking back. The new stair, making it an outdoor stair, again having to do a saving, saving money, but still making that outdoor stair into a kind of room. Here you can see the strategy with um, the road that loops around. So we push it down to connect to the new parking and then it gets pulled back up so that it can provide the new entrance to, to campus. Here's the view. That, that road also provides a buffer between the school and a, a pretty dangerous park that's to, to this side and then also to, to Loyola. So the, the ring road around the whole school be, begins to behave a little bit like a moat and creates a kind of buffer and safety zone for the kids. Um, the, this is the view of that um, porch from, from that road and you can see here the gym we have the, uh, just written the name of the school in the back of the gym, and, and um, this is a school that's used 24-7. It's used, uh, the kids start arriving at 7 a.m., so it's often dark when they get there, and they, they stay until 6 p.m. So one of the issues with the project is that um, another strategy that we employed with the project as far as its location was that uh, by putting it, sorry, by locating it in this part of the site, this is on the west side of the site, so not only did it allow us to connect to these bridges and to the existing building, but it allowed the new structure to shade the entire playground in the afternoon. So anytime after 2.30, uh, which is typically when aftercare goes from 2.30 to 6 p.m., the entire playground is shaded for the whole afternoon, which is really critical in this part of the city because um, it, it previously was a very hot space that these kids were playing in. And now, you know, just by how we located the building, it provides this amazing quality of shade and, it, and, and a thermal advantage of almost 10 degrees. Here's the, another problem with the project was that we had to be very limited with the amount of glazing that we could use. So uh, we took all the area of glazing that we could afford and we, we compiled it together to make a long line of glazing so that we could accomplish um, more, more kind of qualities of an expansion of space with it. So from the gym, this kind of long horizontal um, glazing condition gives you an amazing kind of extension to the to the outdoor playground while at the same time providing this um, very strong quality of a room. It is super simple, just a felt acoustical material on the ceiling, paint, and uh, minimal glazing opening. Uh, the interiors were very, very, very low budget. Um, of course, these columns that you see are not only columns for the project, but they give the lateral bracing. And um, here you see this bench that are attached to the columns, which, which help enhance a kind of loggia-like condition where people hang out. Also is uh, emergent from a code restriction. Part of the handicap code, when you have a diagonal column like this, you have to create uh, railings around these so that blind people can see where the column is. So instead of creating railings around our um, diagonal brace columns, we, we created benches that, that, again, did a few things at once. Also, the school is used at nighttime. Uh, by two different groups, by adult education, uh, English as a second language, and also religious education. So the quality of light at night is um, figured very importantly in how we thought about the project and is uh, the way that that whole porch space is lit and the way that you see it from the distance is an important part of um, 
how you interact with it at night, which, which it's used at night almost every day of the week. Um, the community that's served by this parish is over 20,000 people. Um, it's a huge, they do uh, like something like 10 ser separate services every Saturday, every Sunday morning in the church. So the main function of the parking underneath is about connecting to the church. So from the parking, there's a direct connection to the church. There's a diagram showing how um, we filtered all the surface water from the project through the planters on the site. Uh, and all the water of the project is um, fully filtered before it goes back to the city streets. So all the water exiting our project is um, uh, completely filtered. The landscape, we had to, again, for cost reasons, we had to use very small landscape and it's gonna take a few years to grow in, but eventually the whole project will be surrounded by like, by a green wall on all three sides. And it has 28 trees, so there'll be an amazing canopy of trees in the front park and, uh, and around the playground. Um, this is some examples of how the space is used. One of the things about this new porch is that they find that they use it in, in many, many different ways. Um, everything from church services that you see here to um, using it on Halloween, their festivals. They, the pastor was just telling me the other day, Father Jay was telling me that people actually hang out now on Sundays after the service on the picnic tables and um, gather in small groups, which they never had done before. And this was a service that occurred at four o'clock in the afternoon, and you can see that the entire area, over 700 seats, were all in shade. Uh, this shows you that they have new uniforms. So now their uniforms are blue and, blue and orange. The, we've changed their uniform colors because of the color of the building. And they've also started to appropriate some of the other elements of the project in new ways that 